Hello. So, I have sometimes pointed out that I believe that the poetic Edda is a testimony to a spiritual tradition which ultimately transcends the borders of culture. By all means, Norse mythology is obviously strongly flavoured by Viking Age culture, which is why I sometimes talk about Old Norse culture and history as a means to understand the background to their mythology. The imagery, the symbols and the metaphors applied by Norse poets when retelling the myths are without a doubt rooted in the realities, the often harsh realities, of Old Norse culture. Yet, the imagery, the symbols and the metaphors applied also reveal deeper spiritual messages which appear to be more universal than cultural. Some of these messages are very subtle indeed and may have been recognisable perhaps only to those who were initiated into the mysteries of Sider, Galdir, poetry, runes and precious mead. Now I could well argue that what I just said is the case based on proper academic research. I'm not the only one who has discovered that hidden meanings in the myths are a fact, a fact that even corresponds perfectly with the rules of Old Norse poetry making. There is really no doubt that the Norse poets tried to convey deeper meanings through metaphors. But what are those deeper meanings? Well, some would try to take the approach of Carl Gustav Jung, who believed in mythical archetypes and a sort of common archetypal mind shared by all humans. I would take it a lot further than to the world of archetypes, though. I have sometimes pointed out similarities to old Indian traditions and to classical mystery cults, both religions and spiritual paths that, um, that were concerned with spiritual transformation and illumination through union with the divine. Today I'm going to make comparisons to a tradition of knowledge which at first sight seems very different. As I discovered for myself what I'm now convinced is the nature of these hidden meanings in Norse myths, I came to personally believe that these deeper messages, the messages that are hidden behind the culture-specific imagery, belong to an age-old and almost pan-human tradition of spiritual transformation. And I want to point out here that to say something like that, what I just, just said, is often thought of as controversial. Furthermore, the lines between the two cultures that I'm going to draw next um, are sometimes based on my personal conviction, convictions and all of them may not be scientifically proven. One of the reasons I po point out this caution is that I'm going to refer to a source that is very controversial, seen from an academic point of view. So please be aware that the connections I'm going to make between that source and Norse myths are strictly a matter of personal opinion. So this is my slightly controversial standpoint. There are some universal messages in the Edda, deep insights that transcend the borders of culture. Insights found in countless cultures that to all appearances have nothing to do with each other. I believe that these deeper insights belong not to any particular culture or tradition, but that they belong to humankind, perhaps reaching back into a lost prehistory, or perhaps just testifying to some ultimate truths that have been perceived by different peoples at different times. And from this point of view, the poetic Edda is one culture's testimony to a very ancient lore of knowledge, almost forgotten in the Western world after centuries of oppression. <clears throat> Sometimes the universal messages cannot be easily traced back to any known historical cultural connections. I'm going to take a swift ride to a culture that apparently has never had any connection with Viking Age culture whatsoever, namely pre-conquest Mexico, in order to point out just one such amazing conceptual parallel. I'm going to read to you a passage from a book called The Fire from Within by Carlos Castaneda. For those of you who have not heard about Castaneda, he was a social anthropologist who from the 1960s onward became apprentice to a Yaqui Indian sorcerer called Don Juan in Mexico. The sorcerer Don Juan instructed Castaneda on a number of issues that have to do with human perception of the great mystery that is the world. The books are very recommendable, I think, thought-provoking and mind-altering. They should also be read with great sobriety because, um, really, I have met some very 
very self-important guys who have become totally delusional after reading these books. They think they are seers and masters and sorcerers just because they have read these books and had a couple of visions. Uh, but for those who are more grounded and have a bit of self-insight to start with, these books can hold only great interest. They are also highly controversial from an academic point of view. Castaneda has been criticised for not really revealing the real identity of his source, Don Juan that is, and for not attaching the teachings of Don Juan to any known contemporary culture. He has even been accused of having made the whole thing up. After having lived in Mexico for several years myself and experienced a thing or two in my life, I am personally convinced that his books are based on actual experience and that the teachings of Don Juan represent an ancient pan-human art of seeing, exactly as Don Juan himself claimed. Don Juan often spoke of the heritage of knowledge provided by the so-called old seers. The old seers were sorcerers living in Mexico at some point before the European conquest. Don Juan never specified who they were or what culture they belonged to, although he named them Toltecs. It is believed that the Toltecs were a pre-Aztec culture and very warlike, but Don Juan claimed that the name was used not to describe a culture, but to describe the old seers and their art of seeing. So what I'm going to read to you is about what some of these old seers witnessed about the greater cosmos, the part of cosmos that is inaccessible to ordinary human perception but which could be glimpsed by trained seers who are accustomed to altering their perception. When the terms to see and seeing are used in this context, Castaneda is referring to an art of perceiving the invisible which has nothing to do with looking at things. It has rather to do with seeing the realities that are hidden behind the apparent reality. Well, I read. Don Juan said that the old seers, risking untold dangers, actually saw the indescribable force which is the source of all sentient beings. They called it the eagle, because in a few in the few glimpses that they could sustain, they saw it as something that resembled a black and white eagle of infinite size. They saw that it is the eagle who bestows awareness. The eagle creates sentient beings so that they will live and enrich the, aware the awareness it gives them with life. They also saw that it is the eagle who devours that same enriched awareness after making sentient beings relinquish it at the moment of death. For the old seers, Don Juan went on, to say that the reason for existence is to enhance awareness is not a matter of faith or deduction. They saw it. They saw that the awareness of sentient beings flies away at the moment of death and floats like a luminous cotton puff right into the eagle's beak to be consumed. For the old seers, that was the evidence that sentient beings live only to enrich the awareness that is the eagle's food. The eagle is as real for the seers as gravity and time are for you, and just as abstract and incomprehensible. <laughs> Now Don Juan went on to explain that the eagle transmits so-called emanations, emanations of awareness, and he explained the emanations thus. The eagle's emanations are an immutable thing in itself, which engulfs everything that exists, the knowable and the unknowable. There is no way to describe in words what the eagle's emanations are, they must be witnessed by the seer. They are a presence, almost a mass of sorts, a pressure that creates a dazzling sensation. One can only catch a glimpse of them, as one can only catch a glimpse of the eagle itself. It goes without saying that the eagle is the source of the emanations. To sum it up in my own words, the seers of old Mexico, according to the sorcerer Don Juan, as rendered by Castaneda, perceived of a central cosmic source of awareness. Awareness runs through the universe at large in the form of emanations coming out of this central source. As sentient beings, we all relate to these emanations. Our awareness is shaped by them and we are shaped by our awareness, by how and what we perceive.
The gigantic source of the mysterious cosmic emanations was called the eagle, not because it actually was an eagle, but because it appeared to resemble an eagle. And just as this eagle bestows awareness through its emanations, so it also feeds on our awareness once we die. Now, I'm not going to discuss the truth value of this claim about the cosmic eagle. What I'm going to say is that I believe that a very similar concept had an important, even central place in Old Norse mythology. We are speaking of the great giant in eagle disguise that frequently shows up in Old Norse sources. It appears in the Prose Edda, it appears in the Poetic Edda, it appears in a 9th century skaldic poem known as Haus Lang, and it appears in numerous Fornaldar Sögur, that is, the sagas of olden times, which carry a lot of mythical and folklore material. So this is the eagle of Norse myths. The oldest Norse description we have of the eagle is actually found in the skaldic poem Haustlong, which was created by the poet Chudolf of Wien, who was a skald at the court of the Norwegian king Harald Hårfagri. The poem dates back to about the year 900 AD, no later anyway, and is rendered and explained by Snorri in the Prose Edda. It relates the story of how the goddess Idun was abducted by the giant eagle called Chatsi. I have written uh, a quite interesting, if I may say so myself, article about that poem and its mythology and there is a link to that article in the description beneath this video. For now we shall have a look only at the giant eagle Chatsi. So the first question, as always in my research, is what does the name Chatsi mean? It is derived from the Old Norse verb Chatsa, which means to enslave bind, capture. So I translate the name Chatsi to mean the slave binder. And this in itself is an interesting name when compared to how Don Juan proceeds to describe the cosmic force known as the eagle in his Mexican tradition. For he emphasizes how we are all literally slave bound to this force, our awareness stems from it and returns to it in death. Both Chudolf and later Snorri describes the slave binder, Chatsi, as being of enormous size, exactly as the Mexican eagle is said to be of infinite size. There are many other names of this, uh, for this eagle in Shulov's poem. As always in Norse poetry, one character appears with countless names that describe its function. One of the other names for Chatsi is Val Kastar. Val means choice, but also refers to death, the dead, and more specifically to the chosen dead. Kasta means to throw, so that the name could be translated as the death thrower, linking the Norse eagle to death. It could also possibly mean the choice thrower, which is equally interesting, as I shall see. Other names that associate Chatsi with death uh, describe him as uh, the ghost of the giant world. He's said to be very hungry, and he's the vulture of the flock, and the seagull of entrails. Seagull. Snorri explains that all masculine birds, such as the seagull, can be used in poetry and myth to replace the concept of the eagle. That would include the raven, the rooster and the vulture as birds describing the cosmic eagle. So we have a slave-binding force in the poem strongly associated with death. Chatsi is also described as flapping his wings so that he creates whistling winds and he is said to be seated in an age-old tree. Now these aspects of Chatsi links him with another eagle figure described by Snorri in the Gylfaginning prose Edda, where we hear that there is a giant in eagle disguise who sits by the end of heaven in the top of the world tree and from his flapping wings come the winds across all people. His name is Rasvelger, a name that literally translates as corpse swallower. <laughs> Um, this giant in eagle disguise is also described in the Edda poem Vaftrudnir's Mål, where Odin is engaging the giant Vaftrudnir, whose name means the powerful head will, to a contest of wisdom. The god asks, and this is from stanza 36 and 37 in the said poem, <clears throat> Tell me the ninth, as they say you are wise, and if you, Vaftrudnir, know, from where comes the wind that moves through the waves, even if we never see it ourselves? And Vafthrudnir, the powerful whale, replied, 
His name is Corpse Swallower, by the end of heaven, a giant in eagle's disguise. From his wings they say that the wind comes to all human beings. Whereas the Edda reveals that this eagle sits at the end of the world, Snorri said that he sits at the top of the world tree and to the north. In Norse cosmology, Hel, the realm of death, is situated to the north. Just as the eagle swallows the dead, so Hel is the place to which all the dead return, although it is also the place from which everything began. In the Norse creation, Misty Hel is a place that existed before time itself and from which both the world giant and the first acid emerged from. The name Corpse Swallower is pretty unambiguous, uh, revealing that this giant in eagle disguise devours the dead. The imagery is, my, is, in my opinion, completely consistent with the Mexican idea of the gigantic eagle-like figure which devours the awareness of the dead. That the corpse swallower is identical to the slave binder is clear through their descriptions, as well as the fact that they are both associated with an age-old tree in which top they are seated. The tree is a world tree, the metaphor for the universe itself. And like the Mexican eagle, they sit at the very beginning and end of the universe. The Mexican eagle emanates awareness which are compared to an unseen presence, like a pressure, which rules us but nevertheless is invisible to our ordinary human perception. The fact that this awareness takes the form of emanations indicates a kind of streaming movement, originating in the cosmic source, creating the world and the awareness of living beings. In the Old Norse myths, these emanations are called winds. Winds which move through or across the so-called waves, that is, I believe, the same as vibrations. Is it possible to compare the Mexican cosmic emanations with the Norse cosmic winds? Well, both the emanations and the winds stem from a gigantic cosmic force which is described as looking like an eagle, but not quite being an eagle and which devours the dead. Another similarity is the fact that both the emanations and the winds are associated with awareness. Yes, winds and mind or awareness are very much connected in Norse poetry. As Snorri said, consciousness is called the wind of the giantesses. Or rest my case. Well, not entirely. I'm going to continue. Don Juan made it clear to Castaneda that the eagle was a, a metaphor, a way of describing the indescribable. The Norse myths also reveal that the eagle shape is a disguise, a hide for a giant. The image of the eagle shows up other places in the Edda lore. As a giant eagle, it turns up in the poem of Helgi Hjörvardsson, where it guards two maidens in a land of fire and sleep. Yeah, the land is actually called Svavalan, which means the land of falling to sleep. The maidens can only be brought out of the sleeping realm if the eagle is killed. Um, there are associations to fire and flames in the realm of the eagle, a theme we shall return to. Another giant in eagle disguise is Sutdunger, whose name means heavy with drink, from Sut, drink, and Tunger, heavy. He is the father of the maiden who guards the precious drink of poetry, and the one who allowed Odin to have both the maiden and the drink, although not without the prize. There is also a fire involved, but again we shall return to that later. To get hung up on the eagle will not take us all the way, you see. The eagle is but a metaphor for something different, something mysterious and big that can only be described through metaphor. We shall look at other possible ways of describing this cosmic force. I cannot stress enough how important it is to realize that the Old Norse poets would use numerous ways of describing the same essential thing through applying metaphors. This description, the descriptive variations are countless, but essential themes are actually quite few and concentrated. In order to identify the essential theme here, we have to look past the imagery, such as the image of the eagle, and into the essential meaning. As I see it, the essential meaning is that there is a cosmic source to all awareness which is also the same as the source of death, a point of origin to which all awareness returns, as if drawn back by unseen movements. 
These movements are like winds emanating from the original source, permitting existence with awareness and drawing awareness back into itself. Where, in Norse mythology, can we find symbolic, metaphorical imagery which seems to be describing this same essential theme? The eagle is so clearly an image of the realm of death that another description of this realm is the most obvious place to begin. And Hel, Misty Hel, is the most obvious description of the realm of death that we find in the Edda. Within Misty Hel, there is a well, or let us say, a water source. This is the well into which the dead are thrown, in order to be consumed by serpents. The well of Hel is called the Vergelmir, which could translate as the resounding mill, or the resounding cauldron. The word ver may mean either mill, where substance is ground into tiny particles, or a cauldron, where things are being cooked up. The word gelmir, which I have translated as resounding, could according to some old dictionaries actually mean a young eagle. Then we could be speaking of a well in hell called the eagle mill, or the eagle cauldron. However, it might just, uh, may just as likely mean resounding. And the resounding theme is typical of the underworld. They have the Jallarbru, for example, which means the resounding bridge, which is the bridge between the world of the living and the world of the dead. The river that this resounding bridge is crossing, that is, the river that forms the border between life and death, is simply called Jöll, which means resounding. In the first video I made in this series, I explained how the name of the world giant Ymir is derived from the Old Norse word Ymir, which means sound. When Ymir is slain and his body used to shape the universe, this is a metaphor for how the original unifying sound was separated into many different tunes, giving us the message that the universe is created by an orchestra of tunes, of sounds, which are also, in the myths, associated with waves and streams. I take it that sound vibrations were perceived as essential to the creation of the cosmos and that the idea is that these sounds, sound vibrations originated as one great sound source. So here we have Ymir, the original sound, becoming the material for the creation of the universe through the separation into countless tunes. But Ymir is not on his own. He was nurtured by the cosmic cow, Audhumbla, abundant brew ingredients, in fact, by the rivers of milk that ran from her teats. Enter the rivers and the streams. As a parallel, we see the well of Hel, which is obviously related to sounds, and from which it is said, all rivers stem. In the Edda poem Grimnis Mål, we learn that all rivers in the world are derived from the resounding cauldron of Hel, the eagle's mill. So what are these cosmic rivers really, if not just another way of saying emanation, a streaming movement? Moreover, the so-called rivers get their so-called water from a very interesting source. Apparently, a stag stands at the roof of Valhalla and eats of the world tree. That is, we are speaking of a force which devours the universe itself continuously. And from this nourishment, water drips down into the well of hell and becomes the rivers that run through the world. Again, we're speaking of a cosmic source of origin which actually emanates all movement of the universe and which continuously feeds on the experience of the universe itself. Into the well of hell, uh, the dead go. Just as one image, uh, as in one image, they are devoured by the eagle, they are devoured in hell's well by serpents and wolves. The rivers of the world, the movement of the world, flows out from a place where the living relinquish their awareness in death. This description of hell is essentially exactly the same as the image of the eagle. Moving on, you might as well have a look at the other wells associated with the roots of the world tree, the world tree being of course an image of the universe. Replacing the well of Hel and its running rivers, we may look at the well of memory, that is, the Mimisbrunner. The name translates as the well of Mimir, known as a great giant friend of Odin, but whose name should be taken seriously. His name means the rememberer, the memory. According to Snorri, this well contains all the tidings of the world. That is, it contains the descriptions, the stories, the memories of the world and the beings who live in it. 
Mimir, the memory, drinks from this well every day so that he may be compared with Suttungr, whose name means heavy with drink. Now, the drinking of cosmic memory seems to me to be yet another image of a cosmic source that devours the awareness of the universe after lived lives. It is obviously a place where the memory of universal awareness is stored, but does it also transmit something akin to the wind-like, wave-like or river-like emanations of the eagle? Indeed, if you look closely at this myth, you will realize that the giant Mimi, that is, the memory, drinks from the well of memory, much like the eagle, the giant in eagle disguise, feeds on awareness, and he drinks through a horn called Yallar horn, the resounding horn. The, this drinking horn not only associates the well of memory with the well of hell through the resounding Yallaryel theme, but also with the god Heimdall, whose name means the great world, and who, rather than drinking from the horn, blows out through the resounding horn, the Yallar horn, whenever there is a meeting between dimensions. And what is he blowing out? Sound, obviously sound imbued with the memories of the world. As I've said before, Heimdall, who hears all and sees all, is identical to Mimir, who remembers all, and they are linked through their shared property, the resounding horn. What went into the well of memory comes out in the shape of sound, a kind of vibration essential to creation. And we are seeing the same theme of cosmic source again and again and again. Then, to the third well, the one situated in the heart of Åsgarder, the realm of the gods. This is the Urdarbrunner, the well of origin. The well is owned by the Norn Urdur, whose name means origin or beginning or before. I like to use the translation origin. She is the oldest of the Norner, the fates, the most powerful beings in the cosmos since they create all cosmic laws and all destiny, and they created the runes that Odin discovered and made known. Uh, uh, anyway, the well of origin is the water from which the universe, symbolized by the world tree, is nourished. The old lady herself goes out every day to water the tree from her well, and the water of the well replenishes, rejuvenates and heals the world tree. It also has the quality, says Snorri, that if a person bathes in that water, he or she will be transformed, emerging like a transparent, bright, ethereal being. This water is also from where all the norns emerge, all the fates. What are they? They are the fates of the individual beings. At the birth of a human being, according to Norse myths, a fate will descend or ascend from the well of origin in order to shape the fate of the newly born. She will follow her human throughout his or her life, continually spinning away, shaping the life unto death. Then, we must assume, she will return to the source of origin in order to be renewed before a new birth. And what does the Norn has to do with awareness, memories and the river-like, wind-like emanations of the source? Everything. What is fate but the story of a life? The fate of a person is the story of that person. The fate of a society is the story of the society. The Norn, the fate goddess of each person, tells your story and holds your story in her hands. It will remind us of Odin's wife Frigg, a goddess who knows all fate and who also goes by the name Saga, which means the story. I've earlier claimed that the wives of the Aesir represent their personal fates and Frigg is Odin's fate, his story. So once again we find an interesting parallel to the eagle's emanations. The emanations carry awareness out into the universe from the cosmic source that is their purpose. The emanations also carry the echoes, the memories of experience back to the source. In the same way, the Norns emerge from and later return to the well of origin, carrying the stories, the experiences of lived lives, the part of our lives which requires awareness, perception. Um, so may, may the Norns uh, somehow truly be identical to the emanations, to the rivers, to the winds, to the waves of the universe. Let us look a bit closer at these ladies who follow each of us through life according to Norse beliefs. 
First of all, the concept of spinning or weaving norns is significant, I think. In pagan times, women would use the, the rhythmic and repetitive movement of spinning and weaving to enter trance and have visions about fate, which is probably why the norns are described as spinning and weaving the threads of fate. But let us stop and consider these threads of fate. Each thread, obviously, is a story, a life story. And in a weave, these stories interact with other stories. At birth, the Norns would apparently arrive and start throwing the stories, the threads of fate, around to begin the weave of life. In Castaneda's descriptions, the emanations of the eagle are often described as fibers of filaments moving through the universe. I wonder if the fibers of the weave may be yet another image describing the emanations of awareness. The fate goddesses of the individual men and women resemble in the way they are described and named a part of the human soul. That is what I think anyway. Sometimes she is called a spodis, which means a prophetic goddess. That is when she appears to her person with advice and guidance or warnings. Sometimes she is called a filga, a follower, and operates like a sort of guardian spirit to her human. Or she may be called a dis, which just means a goddess, or a harminga, which probably means a shape walker, and which seems to refer to that part of the soul which can move outside of the body. And then she may turn out to be a Valkyria, or simply be called a Norn, a fate. She is not only responsible for spinning the life, but also to choose a death, and to carry the dead back into hell, or to Valhalla. Um, it was thought that a person could have one, three, nine, or two, or three by nine norns in his or her following. Um, the many norns would usually be just silent attachments to one leading norn. The personal fate or fates could be of different kinds. What kind of fate goddess you had would show through the fortune or lack of fortune in your life. Uh, most people have sleeping fates, the daughters of Dvalin, which means hibernation. Uh, if your fate goddess was sleeping, your life would be randomly spun and easily unfortunate. Other, it was like she was spin, spinning in blindness. Uh, other people had divine fates, like the heroes of the Edda who woke up their fates during a trial of initiation to find that once awakened, the, the, the fates were powerful Valkyrie who would lead her person to honor and glory. Um, other people had elfin fates, akin to the light elves, who were immortal and lived in the upper heavens. Now, through my studies over a long time, I have come to believe that the often recurrent Norse theme of waking up a giantess goddess or Valkyria who resides in a hidden but glorious realm in the underworld has to do with a path that is all about waking the personal fate. And when the fate is woken and released from her slumber in the underworld, she becomes an important part of the hero's life. His life becomes rich in wisdom and power and is able to gain control over his destiny and he has a choice of what he's gonna do after death. I have talked about this and written a lot about this. Uh, there is a link to my thesis on my channel for example. So I will just move on to draw the connection between the fates that emerge from the well of origin and the emanations or rivers, waves or winds that emerge from the cosmic source in so many different mythical versions. What is the connection between the fate goddesses and the emanations of awareness? <clears throat> we have mentioned the parallel between the norn and the emanation when it comes to creating and carrying the life stories from a source and returning it to the same source. Like the emanations, the norns emerge from the cosmic source. Like the emanations, they are closely linked to both awareness and death. We have also mentioned the possibility of the thread and the weave as images of fate as actually also being an image of the emanations of life. Are there any other aspects that link the norms with the rivers, the waves and streams of universal awareness or an experience, the stories woven through existence? There is a stanza in the Poetic Edda where the Harmingur, another name for the follower Norns, are compared with the great rivers flooding the world. Or as it is said from Vaftrudni's Mall, stanza 48 and 49, Odin said, Much did I travel, much did I try, much did I test the powers. 
Who are the women so exceedingly wise who are streaming across the ocean? And Vaftrudnir said, Three great rivers stream through the home of the kin trackers' maidens. How mingur are they when they are in the world, although they are born among giants? The fact that the Norns are here described as streaming across the ocean and that they are like great rivers streaming through the world. Yeah, the, the home of kin trackers' maidens is a metaphor for the world. Um, well, this makes us once again think about how the emanations are flowing through the universe. It is also said that they are born among giants, a claim that is confirmed many times in the sources. The fates began as giantesses. Um, so let us take a little detour into the giant realm. In the realm of giants we find yet another image of the cosmic source, the same cosmic source of awareness. We find that there is a sort of ocean, a cosmic ocean I believe, in which the giantess Ran receives the dead, those who have drowned at sea. Now this could be, as most people think, a sort of ocean goddess, but she is clearly also a death goddess. In poetry she is described the same way as Hel is, an attractive beautiful woman who invites people into party and lovemaking. Her embrace is, however, death. Yeah, if what I just said uh, about uh, Rans and Hel's looks uh, surprised you, it is probably because you have been reading Snorri's version of Hel as a very grim looking outcast girl. Uh, however, his description is a late one and does not correspond with earlier descriptions from sources of Norse poetry. As said, Hel is a real babe according to some poems and so is Ran, although they are also terrifying and menacing. But returning to Ran, the queen of the ocean, an alluring woman who awaits the drowned with her net. That the ocean in itself is a poetic image of the realm of death itself is not so strange. During the Viking Age, death at sea or death by drowning was extremely common. And so the ocean becomes the earthly version of the cosmic ocean in which there is an ancient entity who attracts and claims the dead. It is the same image all over again, and Ran's net with which she catches the dead is yet another image of the weave of life uh, with which, uh, well, made out of countless different threads of fate, of life stories. Now, this Ran, Ran has a husband called Egir, whom I have earlier identified with the other world giants such as Suttungur, Heimdall, Ymir, and so on. Egir lives at an island called Hlesei, which means the wind-shielded island. Knowing that wind equals death and the emanations of awareness, we realize that Egir lives in a place that is shielded from these forces. So, I call it the island of immortality, but it might just as well be identical to the grove, the well, the source from which everything stems. The couple, Ran and Egir, has nine daughters, and interestingly enough, these daughters are identified as waves. They're also, they are the waves that bring the dead back into the net of Ram. They're also called rivers, and they are called the lights of the gods. Their father is said to be steering the winds and the waves. In one Edda poem, the Odrun Grotur, we learn that the daughters who emerge from the island called Lese, the windshielded island, the island of immortality, are in fact Valkyrir, that is, they are fate goddesses. So, in several other places we learn that nine sorceresses gave birth to this world at the end of heaven, which is the exact same location given to the great eagle. Thus, we learn something interesting. The mothers of the world are giantesses and fate goddesses who emerge from the realm of death as daughters of the primeval couple. The male in that couple stands in the ship harbour of his shielded island or grove of immortality, staring the winds and the waves, his daughters. The female of the couple awaits with her net as the daughters bring back the dead and receives the results, the remnants of the dead, taking them into her net and, we may suspect, devours them. But just as she receives the dead, she also births the daughters that create fate, they crea that create life stories. So once more, we have the same essential description of a cosmic source of awareness, a source of fate and life stories, which also re receives the memories of the dead. 
people get easily hung up in geographical borders and individual characters when they try to understand myths. Look beyond all that and into the essence of what is being conveyed here and you realize that there is no difference between the three wells and the three roots of the world tree. There is no difference between these wells and the image of the eagle or the image of Egir and Ram. It is the same story told over and over again using new imagery every time following the rules of Old Norse poetry. You have the well of origin and fate from which the fates come. You have the well of hell and death from which the rivers come. You have the well of memory from which intelligence and sound vibrations come. You have the mead of poetry from where knowledge comes. You have the cosmic ocean death realm from which the mothers of the world emerge in the shape of rivers, waves and lights. You have the story of Ymir, the great cosmic sound, whose body was divided into countless tunes, and you have the eagle from which the winds of consciousness emanate. All these different descriptions do not describe different geographical areas. They are all using different images describing the same awesome, unexplainable phenomenon, the cosmic source, which essentially is exactly the same as that described by Castaneda in his book, The Fire From Within, the ego and its emanations of awareness. So, <clears throat> what is the point of knowing all this? Why were Norse poets so obsessed with describing the cosmic source over and over again in various ways? I will look to Castaneda again in order to offer a very possible clue. Uh, now I'm going to use my own words in order to summarize and simplify the explanations given because Castaneda uses a lot of terms that are only understandable to those who have seriously studied his work. So to explain it in simpler terms, a human being is, according to Don Juan, ultimate, ultimately an energy being. We perceive normally only the physical reality of our bodies, but beyond that physical reality there is a greater reality where we are pure energy. And this energy is made up of the threads or fibers or filaments of the cosmic emanations. The human energy body is like a cocoon made up of such fibers. However, the ordinary human being will not make any use whatsoever of most of these fibers. When a seer looks at the energy cocoon of a human being, the seer will observe that most of the cocoon of a human is dimmed and only a very small part lit up. That tiny light is our conscious awareness, but it only lights up a very small part of ourselves. We have a sort of glow of awareness that is normally restricted to move only in a very, very small part of the entire energy body. And this is the reason why we hold on to a rather limited particular perception of the world and ourselves in it. But it is only a very tiny portion of what we really are. The seer is a person who learns to expand the glow of awareness until it covers the entire energy body, so that we light up every part of ourselves and become whole beings. When the glow of awareness has expanded to the entire energy body, we light up like a fire, and that is what is called the fire from within. It is to become aware of the entirety of ourselves, and when the seer has succeeded in lighting the fire from within, the seer becomes free of the devouring beak of the eagle. At death, the seer will be able to maintain his or her awareness so as not to become consumed into that great cosmic pool of memories. To maintain awareness is to maintain one's life on an energy level. It is a way to achieve individual freedom and immortality. To achieve this result is the reason why the old seers wanted to learn about the eagle and its emanations in the first place. Now, to Norse mythology, there are countless stories of such feats, but I will concentrate mainly on the eagle stories. As far as I remember, there are three stories of how the eagle is killed, and they all involve the rescue or the guidance of a bright maiden. Firstly, there is the story I mentioned earlier about how the hero succeeded in rescuing two maidens from the giant and eagle disguise while in the land of going to sleep. 
significantly, there is a fire involved. Secondly, you have the story of how Loki rescued the goddess Idun from the giant in eagle disguise in the land of the drum. The eagle pursued Loki and the goddess, but lost when the gods put up a great fire in their realm. In the third story, Odin rescues the mead of poetry given to him by the maiden Gunnlöd, who also aids him in the escape from her father, the giant in eagle disguise. Her father pursues Odin in his eagle disguise, but Odin escapes while also wearing an eagle disguise. He takes upon himself the same disguise as the great giant of the source. You can ponder the meaning of that yourself. The result is that Odin is able to, be, to come among the binding powers, that is, among the immortal gods. So what is being rescued in these stories? Basically, what is being rescued is either mead, a maiden, or both. The mead of poetry is the mead that contains all knowledge, all memory. It is indeed called, often called the mead of memory, and the poetry that creates the stories of lives. I suppose we could call that awareness. And when it comes to the goddess Idun, we know that she is the power that rejuvenates the gods every day, just like Urdur, origin, is what rejuvenates the world tree. The name Idun means, significantly, the woman who returns to the water source. She is described as the seed of the world tree and as the one lover of all the gods, the oldest and the youngest child of the inner ruler. She is clearly connected to the life and life force. She is also called Dis Forvitim, the knowledge-hungry goddess. And it is her hunger for knowledge that will make us able to draw the connection between the goddess and awareness. Awareness that is so essential to maintaining life. In the Edda, there are many stories and references to the golden lady that may be found in the world of the dead, and that by uniting with her and drinking her mead, one will not only be able to access hidden knowledge, but also be able to escape death. The Golden Lady is strongly associated with fate and knowledge, especially the fate of death. And if she is ultimately a metaphor for the emo emanations of awareness that stream from the cosmic source of life and death, then the idea that she has to be woken in order to reveal the hidden knowledge of personal power and immortality that is always being described in the Edda as, a, as our human heritage, by the way, well then this concept is exactly the same found in the idea of lighting the fire of awareness until it covers the entirety of our being. In my opinion, what is being described in the Edda is a path towards knowledge and immortality akin to that described by Castaneda, where the point is to reach the totality of oneself and to claim one's own fate. The Norse version of the fire from within is perhaps best described in the Völuspå story of the witch called Gullvägr, Golden Drink, another name for Fre Freya. In that story, the divine witch displays her immortality by lighting up in fire three times, emerging unharmed, and thus instigating the path of freedom from being consumed in death. Well, Later, I may begin to explain exactly how that path toward totality may be instigated. For now, I think we have enough to think about for a while. Have a good day.